In this video, we're going to learn how to do the derivative whenever we're encountered with uh, multiplication or division. That's going to be the product rule and the quotient rule. These are a little bit nasty, but at least they're going to work, right? And they're going to work every single time. Uh, so here we go. Let's jump into it. Product rule is first when I have a multiplication between two functions. Here they're labeled as f and g. Then it would be really wonderful if this was true. If I could just take the derivative of the first and then multiply it by the derivative of the second, that would be wonderful. But if that was the, if it was that easy, um, it wouldn't even need its own rule. It would have just been lumped in with all the other derivative stuff we've been doing. Um, but here is the derivative rule for, for multiplication. I'm going to call f the first chunk and g is the second. If you remember it with f's and g's later on in the future, if you see h's and k's, you may, may be stuck. Right, so just remember in terms of first and second, and then it's going to be a little bit easier. But here it is. Uh, whenever you have a first times a second, and you're taking the derivative of that product, here is the rule that needs to follow. You have the derivative of the first times the second plus the derivative of the second times the first. So again, it's the derivative of the first times the second plus the derivative of the second times the first. Essentially, uh, and, there's, and that's, there's some wiggle room here, right? Since this is uh, multiplication, you could flip the order of those two. And since this is multiplication, you could flip the order. And even since that's addition, you could take this whole chunk and flip the order with the other chunk. It doesn't matter, right? Because of the commutative property. Um, but in general, you need one function's derivative and then the other regular function. Then you need the, the, the other regular function and then the first derivative or however you want to think about it. One derivative and then the other non-derivative, the other original. Multiply those two terms together and then add the other uh, chunk from the other two terms. So again, derivative of the first times the second plus the derivative of the second times the first. So let's practice. Part A. We have x times ln of x. So this first chunk is x. The second chunk is going to be my natural log. So let's go for it. The derivative of the first, the derivative of x is 1 times the second. So I'm just going to copy. Plus, then I need the derivative of the second times the first. So there you have it. Like it's not super complicated. It's not ideal. I wish I could just do one times one over x, but then it wouldn't be very, very helpful. So I needed the derivative of the first times the second plus the derivative of the second times the first. And then this one, you could simplify ln of x plus one, right? The x's will cancel. So there you have it. Okay, let's do the second one. Uh, here I've got this first chunk is e to the x, and then the second chunk is that little polynomial. Okay. Ooh, this is f. Okay, instead of y, we'll call it f prime. The derivative of the first times the second, so I'm just going to copy 3x to the fourth minus 2x squared plus 7. And then plus, then I need the derivative of the second piece, which would be 12x cubed minus 4x, and then times the first. And it just says take the derivative. It doesn't say take the derivative and simplify. So you could stop there. I'm going to zoom it in a little bit. I don't know if that helps or makes it worse, but I'm going to try. And then if you wanted to try to simplify it, you would have an e that would factor out of both. Uh, I'm just going to leave it. It didn't say simplify, so I'm just going to leave it. But what's nice is both of those terms, or even if you were to distribute the, a, the e, uh, you could then factor it all out to the front. Uh, but I'm just going to leave it just like that. Okay, let's do the second one then, or it's uh, part c. Here we have x squared plus 3x. That's your first chunk. And then the second is 2x minus 1. You could avoid the product rule if you wanted to. You could just distribute all this, multiply it out, right? Expand it, and you could get the polynomial. And then you could take the derivative of that expanded term, no problem. But if you wanted to take the derivative while it's factored, where I have this first chunk times the second chunk, uh, you could. It just requires the product rule. So let's do it. Derivative of the first would be 2x plus 3 
times the second, so I'm going to copy 2x minus 1, and then plus the derivative of the second is just 2 times the first, x squared plus 3x. So there we have it. Like It's not a terribly complicated rule, but it's a little bit annoying. And of course, I could multiply this stuff out, and I could distribute the two, and then I could combine some like terms. If you were to do that, you'd end up getting 6x squared plus 10x uh, minus 3, which if you would have expanded first and then taken the derivative, or if you take the derivative and then expand it, you would get to this same thing. Uh, so it doesn't really matter. You can either do the algebra at the beginning or at the end if it wants you to, to get the answer as this polynomial. Uh, but I just, I just took the derivative. I'm going to leave it like that. Okay, and then the last one, you have your first term is x squared. The second is sine of x. So here we go, using the product rule. Derivative of the first is 2x times the second plus the derivative of sine is cosine and then times the first. So your product rule, not terrible, uh, but you need to use that rule every time there's a multiplication between two functions. Now, let's do one more example. If I have something that's like uh, y equals, how about we'll do something easy, like 5x squared. Do I have to do product rule when the first term is a constant? No. Can you? Yes. Uh, but let's, let's go for it. The derivative of the first would be 0 times the second plus the derivative of the second times the first. So you can do product rule when one of the terms is a constant, but then half of it ends up copying or canceling, uh, and, then, and then you end up getting the 10x just like you would if you would have just multiplied that 2 down anyways. So if one of the terms is a constant, no, you treat it as a coefficient. You don't have to do product rule. You can, but half of it's going to be 0, uh, so it is not necessary. You can just kind of use that constant multiple rule that we did earlier. Okay, let's move on to the next example. Find the exact coordinates of any stationary points and any inflection points for this curve, x, e to the x, and then we're going to classify the x extrema as either a minimax or neither. Okay, so let's go for it. I need the first derivative, then I'm going to do the first derivative sign chart. That's how I'm going to classify my extrema. So if your original function is x times e to the x, I can take the derivative the derivative of the first is just 1 times the second plus the derivative of the second times the first. So there's your derivative. And then we could factor out that e to the x. And I have just 1 plus x. So I can see, hey, where are my critical points? Uh, potentially, we could set that chunk equal to 0, and then 1 plus x equal to 0. I know that one's going to give me negative 1. That one doesn't have any solutions. The exponential function is never equal to 0. Okay, uh, So we do have the one critical point, uh, and then let's test it to see if it's a min or if it's a max. Okay, so if I were to plug in something like t uh, 0, e to the 0 would be 1, so that's positive. And then 1 plus 0, that would be positive. Okay, great. So I know overall that output would be positive, which means y would be increasing. And then if I tested something like negative 5, e to the negative 5 is just 1 over e to the 5th, which is still positive. Remember, that exponential function is always positive. So just like how if that chunk was squared, you could treat it as always a plus. Same thing for your exponential. Uh, but if I had a negative 5, now that chunk would be negative, which means overall it would be negative. So then your function y would be decreasing. So it does look like we are going to have an extrema. We're going to have a minimum. Uh, so let's let's answer. Uh, we have y has relative minimum at, uh, and then it says the whole coordinates, right? So we need the y coordinate as well. I know the x was negative 1, and then if I just plug this in to the original function, let's see, y of uh, negative 1, so you have negative 1 e to the negative 1, so that's going to be negative 1 over e. 
ugly coordinate point, but that's okay. Uh, y has a relative minimum at that point, and then you could justify it by saying because y prime changed or changes from negative to positive. That's your first derivative test. Okay, so that's not bad. Let's go through and do the points of inflection, which means let's go take the second derivative, and then let's see if the second derivative is ever going to change, and we'll have a point of inflection. Okay, so let's go take the derivative again to get to y double prime. The derivative of e to the x is e to the x, and then this is your same product rule. The derivative of the first is 1 times the second, and then plus the derivative of the second times the first. Uh, so here, this product rule that we're doing for this part, that's the same as what you did at the very beginning. Okay, now you could combine those two. You have 2e to the x plus xe to the x. You could factor out the e to the x. And so now I have a 2 plus x. So it looks like negative 2 now uh, is potentially going to end up being uh, a point of inflection. Let's test it. Okay, remember the e is always positive, so that's nice. If I plug in a number like 0, 2 plus 0, that would be positive, so concave up for your original function. And if I plug in something like negative 5, it's going to be negative. Uh, so yes, that will be a point of inflection. Uh, and then we'll say y has point of inflection uh, at, I know the x. To get the y value, you would just take your x, plug it into the original, uh, but it's going to end up being negative 2 over e squared. Uh, and then we could say because y changes uh, concavity. Or you could say y double prime changes sign. It doesn't matter that it changed from negative to positive. That doesn't make any difference. Uh, the order matters for your first derivative because negative to positive is a min, whereas positive to negative would have been a max. For the concavity, it doesn't matter how it changes. It just matters if it changes. So we did have the, the maximum, or sorry, we did have the minimum, uh, which we found from the first derivative sign chart, and then we found that point of inflection. So there we had it. Everything all done with that example. Just needed the product rule. Okay, so again, let's recap. If I have multiplication between two functions, first and second, don't remember f prime g, g prime f, because later on it may not be f's and g's. Uh, I do believe this formula is in your IB formula booklet, so uh, in theory you don't have to have it memorized, but you really should, right? Honestly, if you're going to test out of calculus 1, you're going to want to know the product rule and the quotient rule. You don't want to have to keep looking it up. Okay, so if I have a multiplication, I have a first, no matter if it's f and g or h and k or l and op, it doesn't matter what functions, there's always going to be a first and a second. So if you remember at first and seconds, you're going to be covered no matter what those happen to be. But it's the derivative of the first, d of first, times the second, plus the derivative of the second times the first. Right, derivative of the first times the second plus the derivative of the second times the first. The order in which you write them and the order in which you say them, they don't necessarily have to be the same because of the commutative property, but you need to use that rule every single time there is a multiplication. Okay, now let's do the quotient rule, which is going to be a little bit worse. Okay, when I have uh, a top and when I had a bottom, again, don't remember it with f's and g's, remember it in terms of top and bottom. Whenever I have a division, there's always a top and there's always a bottom. Uh, and then here is your quotient rule for it. Let me try to keep this on the screen, which is uh, having a whole lot of difficulty doing. It would be really wonderful if uh, I could just do the derivative of the top and then divide it by the derivative of the bottom. If it was that easy, you wouldn't need a rule. Right? If it was that easy, we could have done this back when we did polynomials. Where it's like, hey, if it's addition or subtraction, you just take the derivative and you just add or subtract each piece. I wish it was that easy, but it's not. Uh, quotient rule is a little bit harder. Uh, but let's read through it. Again, we have a top and a bottom. So here's our uh, derivative rule for, for that quotient. You have the derivative of the top times the bottom minus the derivative of the bottom times the top over the bottom squared. I'm going to write it out. So it's the derivative of the top times the bottom minus deriv bottom, oops, times the top, running out of room, 
over the bottom squared. So whatever was in the denominator stays in the denominator. It's just now, oh, that's, that's totally off the screen, my bad. Uh, it's just on this uh, in the denominator now squared. Okay, here's another way of having it written. Um, you see the lower term, derivative of the higher term, minus higher term. Again, you could flip the order of those two. And you can flip the order of those two. Since it's subtraction, you really shouldn't flip the order of those entire chunks unless you're going to bring the negative with this, this second grouping. Um, but how I always remember it and how I try to get my students to remember it is like this. Derivative of the top times the bottom minus derivative of the bottom times the top. And then all of that's over the bottom squared. Find some way to memorize it. I don't care. Uh, there's another cute little uh, mnemonic device. Um, I think it goes something like this. I always kind of mess it up because I, I never use it, but some people like it. Um, when you have a top and a bottom, they think about it as high and low. It's um, low d high, high d low, draw the line and square below, right? Low d high, high d low, draw the line square below. That's, that's another way. If you like that way, that's fine. Uh, just find some way to get this rule in your brain because you need to have it memorized. I mean, not technically because it's on your formula booklet, but really... If you, if you want to have any business testing out of a calculus class, you're going to need to know product rule and quotient rule. Okay, let's practice, and then um, we'll be done. Find the derivative of these functions using the quotient rule. And here we go. We're going to get the tangent one also. I told you we were going to do it at some point. Well, I'm going to live dangerously and try to zoom in and stay on the screen. Always risky. Okay, derivative of the top times the bottom minus derivative of the bottom times the top. All of that's over the bottom squared. The individual pieces aren't hard. It's just remembering the formula that makes it a little bit hard. Uh, well, let's do it. The derivative of the top times the bottom minus the derivative of the bottom times the top over the bottom squared. Uh, x cubed squared, right? If you had x cubed squared, that would be x to the sixth power. So that would be fine. And you could leave the answer like this. Uh, if you wanted to reduce it, it looks like that term has two x's, that one has three x's. So you could reduce it all by two x's. So you have x e to the x minus three e to the x uh, over x to the fourth. And really, if you wanted to, you could factor out the e so e to the x. So there you have it. That's kind of like the nicest looking version of that derivative. Uh, but again, the quotient rule. Derivative of the top times the bottom minus the derivative of the bottom times the top over the bottom squared. The order in which you write it doesn't always have to necessarily match the, the order in which you vocalize it out. Okay, next one. Here I have x squared minus 1, x squared plus 1. So the derivative of the top times the bottom minus the derivative of the bottom is also 2x times the top over the bottom squared. Don't FOIL that out. Please, please, please don't FOIL it out. Never, ever, ever multiply out that bottom squared. Just leave it, right? It's never going to like work to multiply it out and then try to see if something reduces. Leave this as whatever it was squared. Now, if you distribute in the top, I think you're going to have, let's see, a 2x cubed plus a 2x minus 2x cubed plus a 2x. So you will have some terms that cancel. Uh, so this derivative does clean up a little bit. I believe you'll have just a 4x in the numerator, and then your x squared plus 1 quantity squared in the denominator. Because when you distribute, you had some stuff that reduced. Well, that was lucky. I stayed mostly on the screen. Okay, now let's go through and let's prove the de uh, derivative for uh, tangent. Remember, tangent is the same thing as sine of x over cosine of x. Uh, so if you wanted to find and prove the derivative of tangent, you could do it by, by using this quotient rule. Okay, derivative of the top times the bottom minus the derivative of the bottom, the derivative of cosine is negative sine times the top. And then that's all over the bottom squared. OK, so we're done with the calculus. Now it's just a little bit of trig. Let's see, cosine times cosine, that's 
cosine squared, negative, negative, that's plus, sine times sine, sine squared. And then you should know this, hopefully from last year, cosine squared plus sine squared, that's one. That's your big Pythagorean identity. And then one over cosine squared, that is the same thing as secant squared. So there you have it, your derivative of um, tangent is secant squared. Uh, similarly, you could prove that cotan is negative cosecant squared. Uh, you could do something also to, to prove that secant ends up being secant times tangent, and then your cosecant, it's cosecant, so it's negative cosecant cotangent. Again, so, uh, and then we had tangent, got us the secant squared. Uh, these other four trig identities, like or these trig derivatives, they don't, they don't really come up that much. Uh, you could always prove these if you needed to. If you know what the derivatives of sine and cosine are, you should be able to get this, right? That's just sine over cosine. That's cosine over sine. That's 1 over uh, cosine, and that's 1 over sine. So you could prove them, uh, but most of the time, whenever you're on the IB exam, it's just going to be sines and cosines that come up. So I would probably try to learn these because it would be expected in a typical Calculus 1 class that, that you would learn them and you would know them. Uh, but you're really not going to see them uh, in this class. Actually, this is a pretty this is a pretty uh, common question. They will say, "Hey, like prove or show that the derivative of tan is secant squared," which is literally just doing your quotient rule using the derivatives of sine and cosine. So that one's pretty nice, but you got to know the process because eventually, uh, probably about like every two or three years, they seem to have that in one of the uh, in one of the papers. And pretty nice. They could do something for the other ones. I just, I don't remember ever seeing these other ones, but I do know they like to have students show or verify that the derivative of tangent is secant squared. Hopefully it makes sense. Okay, a couple more. We got this, and then we got the next page, and then we done. Okay, so given 1 over uh, 2x minus 3, find the derivative by the quotient rule and then the chain rule. Okay, let's do the quotient rule first. The derivative of the top, oops. There we go. The derivative of the top times the bottom minus the derivative of the bottom times the top over the bottom squared. Now what happens, just like when we had the product with 5 times x squared, whenever one of the layers is a constant, like half of it, it's going to be 0. Uh, so this one, we end up getting negative 2 over 2x minus 3 squared, right? So you can use quotient rule, uh, or for this particular question, you could have you could have rewritten it and done chain rule, because this original function, you could have rewritten it as 2x minus 3 to the negative first power, right? Since this chunk was on the denominator, and that chunk was all just linear in the denominator, you could rewrite it. That's not doing any calculus, that's just rewriting it. And so I see, oh, I've got something to the negative first power, and then that inside piece, right, you could do chain rule. The derivative of this would be negative 1 something to the negative second power. Then whatever was inside would copy. And then you would have to account for that inside function by doing chain rule. And then this would end up giving you that same thing, 2x minus 3 squared. And then, of course, those are supposed to match. Whether you do it with the quotient rule or whether you do it via some other way, of course, you should get the same thing. Okay, I just think it's it's probably just easier to do uh, this one with the, with the chain rule, but if you needed to do the, the quotient rule, that's okay. Half of it cancels, or like a third of it cancels. Okay, this same type of idea is going to come up in the next page. All right, these are the last two examples for us, and then we'll be done. It says, for each of these functions, find the derivative by using the quotient rule, and then by some other method, right? It doesn't specifically tell us, uh, but we're going to do it some other method. All right, so let's do this example A twice, and then we'll do the example B twice, and then we'll be done. Okay, so let's do quotient rule. Always label your work, right? AI, or AII, always label your work for your IB questions. And you would go quotient rule uh, f prime. Am I on the screen? Yep. All right, let's roll. Derivative of the top times the bottom minus 
the derivative of the bottom is all just 2 times the top over the bottom squared it. Let's distribute. We're giving the bottom as it is. Let's distribute the top. So I've got a 6x minus 15 minus 6x uh, minus negative, so plus 4. So the 6x's look like they're going to cancel, and then here we've got a negative 11 over 2x minus 5 squared. Okay, so the answer didn't end up being super terrible, um, but let's try to do it via another way, right? And that other way is instead of doing it with division, we could always rewrite division as multiplication, right? Instead of having this divided by this, I could multiply by the reciprocal. So this original function, you could rewrite it as 3x minus 2 times 2x minus 5 to the negative first power. And now we have a multiplication. So we'll have to do product rule. And we're going to have a chain rule within that product rule. But if you were dead set on avoiding the quotient rule, you could avoid it. Um, I don't, I think that would be silly. I think quotient rule is the easier way to do this one. But you could technically avoid it by rewriting it and doing product rule. Right? Every single division, you can always rewrite it as multiplying by the reciprocal. Let's go for it. Hopefully, we get the same answer. Here we go, product rule. I need the derivative of the first times the second. So the derivative of the first and then times the second. So I'm just going to copy. Plus, I'm going to need to do the derivative of the second times the first. I'm just going to copy the first because I don't have to do anything. And then here I need the derivative of this second piece. So derivative of the first times the second plus the derivative of the second. Still need to do it times the first. And then here we go. This is going to be your uh, chain rule. Uh, you can have negative 1 uh, something to the negative second power. Copy it in, and then chain rule times 2. Okay, so we're done with the calculus. Let us now try to combine these. Let's try to rewrite it, right? This is 3 over 2x minus 5. And then, let's see, it's going to have minus. You've got a 2 times this chunk. Uh, so see minus and then 2 times this, so you have uh, 6x minus 4. And then all of that is over that chunk squared, so 2x minus 5 squared. Okay, so if I wanted to combine these two, I would need to multiply this. 2x minus 5 over 2x minus 5. You're creating the common denominator, uh, which is our least common multiple, right? That chunk already had it. This one needed the extra 2x minus 5. Uh, so here I'd have a 6x minus 15. Uh, and then I know I'm going to have the same denominator. So then minus 6x minus negative plus 4. And then look at that. It's going to get us back to that same thing we got the first way. Oops. I knew I was. I don't even know why I bother ever zooming in. I can never keep it on the screen. Hopefully, hopefully now you can pause it and get caught back up. Uh, but we did derivative of the first times the second plus. There's the derivative of the second times the first. That was the rewriting it and doing the product rule. That's just harder, right? Just do, the quotient rule is hard, but it's not. It's not. It's like you're just making it so much worse. Right? It could be a lot. Could be a lot uh, worse. Product rule and the, and the quotient rule, those aren't like super pretty, but they are rules that work 100% of the time, every single time, uh, which is nice. When we get to integration, antiderivatives later, that's not always going to be the case. And you'll learn about that in a calculus too, if you ever take it. Okay, here we go. Uh, I just rewritten it uh, down here at the bottom. We're going to take the derivative using quotient rule, and then the part ii will be some other way. Let's do quotient rule first. G prime. So I need the derivative of the top times the bottom. Don't forget, it's a minus for quotient rule, plus for product, uh, minus for the quotient, minus the derivative of the bottom times the top. Then all of that's over the bottom squared. OK, let's distribute. So I got a 15x squared minus, I think that's a 30x squared plus a 6x. OK, so let's see. Here I've got uh, a 6x minus 15x squared over 9x to the fourth. You can reduce it all by 1x. Uh, I think you could reduce it by a 3 also, right? Divide all those numbers by 3. So I'll get a 2 
uh, and an X. Uh, so that's going to cancel, that's going to cancel, that's going to be cubic, and then you could also reduce it by a factor of 3. So 2 minus uh, 5X over 3X cubed. So reduce by 3 and X. Right, that was the simplification. So we could take that derivative using the quotient rule. This one actually would be pretty beneficial and would be pretty nice uh, to do via some other way, right? Because this one, you could rewrite it and you could do product rule, sure. That's stupid, don't do that. But you could rewrite this, since this denominator only has one term, you could actually split this function up, right? I could have 5x, am I on the screen? Yep, you could have 5x over 3x squared minus 1 over 3x squared. Since the denominator is only one term, you could split it up. And then here, uh, let's see, I've got an x that'll cancel, so I'm going to have 5 thirds x to the negative first minus 1 third x to the negative second power. And I can actually just algebraically rewrite this so that everything is just a power term. And if everything is just a power term, well, I haven't taken the derivative yet, have I? Sorry, that should just still just be g. If I can rewrite everything so that it's a power term, well, now I only need to use the power rule. So that's going to multiply to the front, so negative 5 thirds x to the negative second. That's going to multiply, so plus 2 thirds x to the negative 3. And then if you wanted to, uh, you could combine them. So we've got negative 5 over 3x squared plus 2 over 3x cubed. Uh, and then if you wanted the common denominator, you need to multiply that by x over x. Uh, and then it's going to get you to that same answer, right? So it's going to match. Uh, that one, since you could uh, split it up and then you could avoid the quotient rule and you could get that done by only using the power rule, that's pretty nice. Uh, avoiding the quotient to do the product, especially if that product involves a chain rule, that's not, that doesn't really make any sense. If you can avoid the quotient and do power, yes, that makes sense. Uh, but sometimes it's just easier to do the quotient rule.